Amen. I don't spend all that much time in back-to-back services, so it's, it's kind of feels strange when you get up the second time straight away. But uh, there was something special here uh, earlier this, this morning, and I just felt it in the house and with the team. So I'm not sure which way we'll go today. Uh, the, the second one, similar, I, I'm sure, but we'll dig a little bit out. Um, there's something... Let me just ask again, I didn't see, but who are the delegates from leadership that are still in the house? Quite a lot of us, so that's good. Just wanted to just check who I'm speaking to. Um, it's a unusually blessed time to be a, alive. Just want to thank the, the musicians today. We had a lot of fun, <laughs> but it was great. Thank you. That song you wrote is very special. One of hundreds more, but very special. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the kingdom in which we are privileged to live. We stand in awe in the presence of a king. And Father, we just thank you for that wonderful moment when through all that awesome understanding of who you are, you bend down, wrap your arms around us and call us son. And the one that we can hardly stand in the presence of wraps close and is our dad. And Father, as we've often said, your blood is flowing through us now. Royalty has finally found a home. And Father, we thank you for that. Give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Give us wisdom to say what needs to be said and wisdom to not to say what shouldn't be said, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. I was in a meeting with some of the younger leaders. Mark was there and some of the others are little time that we call a forum uh, just uh, well it's just like about three years ago I think we were along I think at that time in Jeffries and the uh, question came up something that if you had to do it all over again what would you do you know you hear some people say if they did it all over again they wouldn't change anything I would change a lot I really would personal weaknesses <laughs> there's lots of things Decisions one made that you wish you hadn't made. Um, but in the overall heart of it, there's not much I would change. But you understand what I mean? We're always a work in progress. But in answer to that question, I said something. It was one of those that become defining moments for me, if not for anyone else. And no one else may have even remembered it. But for me, it became a defining moment because as I said it, uh, I realized it's going to determine how I live my life now. And since that moment, I have lived that way. But the point I made was this. If I could do it all over again, what would I do? What would change? It was this. I wouldn't share with the 5,000 what I should have just shared with the 12. And I wouldn't waste time with the 12 what I should have just shared with the 5,000. And... I realized in fatherhood, apostolic leadership, prophetic life, measuring where that line is sometimes is not, it's, well, it is difficult. That's why here, I'm sure, in a church like this, we're mainly dealing with the 12, those that have already counted the costs, determining where they're going, etc. But I've often looked and thought, why did Jesus deal with it differently with the multitude than he did with the, his sons? And I think one of the reasons is what he said to them. After he left the multitude, got into a house with them, only a handful got with him. He taught most of his revelation to small groups. Taught the manifesto of the kingdom, only to a small group really. We think the Sermon on the Mount was to thousands. The Sermon on the Mount was really given to a handful. He shared most of his wealth with small groups said he was at the foot of the mountain, there were crowds around, there were multitudes everywhere, and he said he left the multitudes and went up onto a mountain. 
And his sons, his disciples, came to him. And under them he began to say. Now, of course, later on, I'm sure others gathered and got in on the whole picture. And then he would disperse them again. But at the moment when he sat down, I think what he was saying was this. If you want to live in what you're just looking at at the foot of the mountain, listen careful because you're going to have to become what I'm talking to you about. If you want to live in the kingdom, you're going to have to become the kingdom man. And he began to talk about who he was really and blessed are the poor in spirit, etc. And as we say, the manifesto for the kingdom that in the Bible is recorded in just two or three chapters. But he poured it out to a few when he shared the parable of the sower and the big shift that was going to come on earth to measure, so we could measure all these years on, where are we in that shift? He shared the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and the tares, etc. And it says in Matthew 13 and Luke and Mark, and when you read it through those things, you put them together. It says after he shared the parable, he went into a house. Everyone went home, but a few got into the house with him. And they said, why do you teach them in parables? Fascinating answer he gave. He said, I teach them in parables, so while hearing, they may not hear. It's a great reason. In other words, I teach them in parables so they don't get it. Um, which helped me a lot, young in ministry, because uh, being raised in Sunday school, God bless every Sunday school teacher they needed who signed up for a term and ended up there 20 years later <laughs> in a lot of churches around the world. <laughs> But Sunday school teachers would say, Jesus taught in parables so even little children like you could understand what he meant. It was so releasing for me into ministry when I eventually realized the disciples even really get what he said. So they said to him, why do you teach in parables? And he taught them. He said that. And he said, but unto you, the handful of sons, the 12, unto you it's been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So you don't need to get it in parables. See, the 5,000 will live with the parable. Come along, have a meeting, get blessed, go home, have roast pasta for lunch. <laughs> Enjoy the event. Go to another event next week. But the sons get in the house with their dad. He says, Dad, what are you really about? And unto you, you share the mysteries of the kingdom in heaven. Over this these days we have wonderful input. I've been so moved and blessed in my heart as we've traveled with the different speakers through this leadership. And my bent is just slightly different today to the others because a lot of the input that's come, not all, but uh, a lot of it has come as equipping us for our role uh, in acceleration. How do we accelerate? How do we accelerate our church? How do we accelerate ourselves? How do we accelerate our ministry? I really don't want to accelerate me at the moment. I'm at the other end. Amen. Mara and I were home last week for a week before we came out here. Apart from that, we were only home nine days this year. So we really are not looking for super acceleration, you know, maybe a super acceleration in the speed of the plane. But um, you know what I mean? But I know what we mean as well. But I just want to share with you from my perspective today the acceleration of the kingdom itself. The kingdom on earth which we talk about and live in, it's great acceleration. And what is it, that acceleration? I want to read a scripture to you that I, in the last meeting I just sort of finished with, but I want to read it to you because here comes a foundation out of which I want to talk on that acceleration. So you see... Just as death came into the world through a man, this is 1 Corinthians 15. Let me just say this in preface. This Easter, Sunday morning, Easter, I, I love Easter. Do you enjoy Easter time? I live in a country now where Easter's really not celebrated much because I live in a country where we're not allowed to have religious holidays. or well, not Christian ones, anyhow. <laughs> but uh, uh, basically no Christian holidays. And so there's no official Good Friday. Even a lot of Christian schools go to school on Good Friday. Uh, and there's no, there's Easter Sunday, of course, for the church, but mainly for the world, it's just an egg hunt. And, um, but you know, so we get away with it. But there's no actual religious holidays. And so 
this, we were home in Richmond actually on Easter Sunday. We were having some family time and, and uh, our local work there in Cotton was not meeting on Easter Sunday. So we all went as a group um, to go because of all kinds of things. But we, we went along to an Assemblies of God church. And uh, my daughter's often involved with them in different ways as well as we try to build without walls. And um, we went to the gymnasium service, so they have services running back to back and all that kind of thing. And there's one in the gym for more young people, so we were there uh, in faith. And, um, and as we were sitting there, the young pastor began to share. And as he began to share, the, more the youth pastor there, he, he started to bring the Easter message. And then I went home, turned on television and the local television and a Baptist pastor who shares very well was sharing there and he was sharing his Easter message. And the amazing thing was that every Easter message I heard was nothing really about the Easter story. Up to that, every Easter service I've been at, I can remember it's the story of Mary at the tomb or Jesus coming out of it, Mary going into it or whatever and all the things that surround that, something around each one was teaching on the scripture that I've been just going to read to you now that I've been lost in for the last year. If there's anything that's molded me more in the last year, it's been this scripture. And I went there and he spoke on it. And as he spoke, one of the young grand spiritual grandsons to me coming around said, it was great. He was sharing the same word we've been locked into and he almost went all the way with it as well. He stopped short, but that's fine. I understand that. And, but, you know, and then the guy on TV and I think, why? It's got to be that something is poised on the earth at the moment in understanding this and building our expectation and readiness. And everywhere I heard, everyone was just speaking out of 1 Corinthians 15. People saying the great Easter chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. But it really deals with the resurrection of the dead. Not just Jesus, but that resurrection of the dead. So I want to read that then just enlarge a little bit. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Now I want you to understand, I'm going to talk a little bit about restoration and from Many of us here, it's the oldest message we have in Church of the Nations, really. Or one of the oldest. We've taught it for 30-odd years. But there's something 13 years ago when God put in our heart an understanding of first fruits, teaching and all that we teach on that around the Cotton family, that became so fundamental and so foundational because it was forming in us, not just in our financial realm, what it means in that way, but our destiny on earth that's why we embrace it we got our theological people to look into it first go through the scriptures had jewish rabbis go through the, the the teachings on it and come back and said it's the best understanding of that that we've seen in jewish rabbis in germany so you know we we put it out for the test but why was it so important to us and so important to a family to go through that first fruit understanding because this scripture Anything God does in an economic arena is only to release something in a far bigger arena. Amen. And why, why is it at the end of the restoration process? Because it deals prophetically with the very end of an age, but not the end of time. Called first fruits. It's fascinating, and I'll read that on. See, when you read the scripture, read the little bits that end up the prophetic bit and not just the narrative bit. I love when someone said that, oh, sharing today about the two generations. You know, isn't it amazing that when you read pa uh, Passover, Palm Sunday, sorry, Palm Sunday story, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a discrepancy in their account. One, Matthew says it one way, and the other two say it the other way. Why? Well, it's not because the Bible's full of discrepancies and how do you put it together or something. It's what they saw prophetically. I think they penned not just what they witnessed, but what they saw out of what they witnessed that was prophetically to come. That's why you've got to know the mysteries of the kingdom, not just the narrative of it. Amen? What did Matthew see differently? He saw Jesus riding into Jerusalem on two donkeys. 
the older one and the younger one. He saw him riding in on two generations. That time he rode in on those, but he could see something beyond that the next time he's going to split the eastern sky and these horses, uh, we've said in the earlier service, we are, it's, it's, it's exciting, but the one we're wanting to hear the sound of is one and it's a white horse. And when he rides in that day and the kingdom goes to the next level on earth, he's going to be riding in on the back of fathers and sons, not just one generation. And Matthew got a glimpse of it, I believe. And when he penned it, he saw that detail that the others didn't see because they were focused into him coming at that time. But that coming was going to be a little different. And so in that scripture, it says, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest or the first fruits of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. When? When he comes back where? Here. So when he comes back, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. If we don't understand the fullness of the kingdom, you'll interpret resurrection always just as spiritual resurrection. But there is a resurrection, a physical resurrection for you and I. Either if we're alive here, we'll... When he comes, we'll get our resurrected bodies. If not, the dead in Christ will be raised. Now, you don't hear a lot preached about that, and we don't sit round tables and talk about it, but I find more and now, three times this Easter, anywhere I look, that's what they were talking about, the resurrection. But what is the resurrection of the dead? And why? You see, if Jesus just died on a cross for us to go to heaven, right, then it's almost a little peculiar story that he would... We'd all go to heaven when we die, then he'd bring us back so we could raise us up in our body so he could take us back to heaven. That seems a bit of a roundabout way of getting there. There must be something more in the resurrection of the dead. I come from a different kind of theological background. I come from the Salvation Army. It was a kingdom kind of background, so I never knew anything else growing up. See, I'm... I was Salvation Army, I played the trombone before I could burp kind of thing. And, um, you know, it was life and life abundant, literally. We used to go eight times every Sunday, so I knew Jesus came to give us meetings and give them to us more abundantly. We were, it was a culture that we were grown up in and modeled in. Literally eight times every Sunday we were involved in things. And... Um, but in that, there was a kind of belief in this resurrection of the dead. I didn't really know until some time later. So I, I know the seed of it in my heart and where it's come from. But it says there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first fruit. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come. The end of what? Not the end of the world, but the end of an age. What is that age? It's really the age of restoration, which I'll enlarge on a little bit. But he would come back, and after that the end will come, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power, for Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies under his feet. Now you would have thought that was already accomplished on the cross, which it was. But here he's, Paul is saying, he's coming back, there's going to be a resurrection from the dead. There's going to be a ruling and reigning. There's something we've still got left to do on the earth to complete an age. And in that time, Jesus will still be reigning until he gets every last thing under his feet. Till the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. Government's economic systems are operating under a kingdom economic system. Rulership is now under a new king. Rulership and reigning all over the earth will be set in place and something incredible will be taking place and then an age will come to an end and he will return, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, that means in the language a renewed earth, not a brand new earth, but a renewed earth, the same as you're a new person when you gave your life to Jesus, but you're still here, so you're a renewed new person. That's the same word for the for the uh, world there. And so there's this established world when Jesus takes it again, puts it in the hands of Father, and says, Dad, this was your original plan. Here it is back. 
fully restored, fully complete. When you put Adam and Eve here to rule and reign the first time, here it is back. Dad, it's done. What a day. Can you imagine what it's going to be like for the son when he gives it back to the father? And father says, when I created this globe, I just created it to be with my people, to walk and talk with them, give them the authority, the power to rule and reign it, give them the, the, the anointing to occupy it and to rule it from every corner of it, across every part of it. Dad, here it is back. It's a beautiful thing. So then the end of that age will be, he says he'll turn the king, having destroyed every ruler, every authority, every power. What a wonderful thing. Moments. I was sitting just three or four weeks ago in a movie theater with Marilyn and a group of other apostolic leaders and we all had some sons there with us so we're a group of 30 or 40 of us got to the movie, I think. And we're sitting there watching the movie, uh, Paul, the Apostle of the Christ. And I've seen some posters out here for it, so if you get a chance to see it, have a look at it. Very moving and very challenging, very well written. You might question one or two little things in it, but it's basically just a very well written thing. And as we were going through it, there were just moments, but... I won't go into all the detail of that. I want to enlarge on some other things. But it's really the story of Luke's pursuance of Paul when he was in Rome, when he was in prison, when Paul was in prison. And he arrives in Rome, and Rome's in a mess. Paul's been arrested. The church is under incredible persecution. The only light on the streets at night in Rome are bodies of Christians that are burning alive on posts to light the streets so the Romans can walk. Not the picture of the early church we sometimes imagine when we get it from our Western mindset of surplus and personal gain and what's in it for me kind of mentality. See, Paul wasn't in prison laying hands on some rock saying, I claim a new prison. He was saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Luke, a son to him in the movie at least, Luke, a kind of a son, finds him. He finds him through getting to Aquila and Priscilla's church in the house. It's under tremendous persecution. They're hidden. They're going through the wrestling of their life. Should they remain or should they leave town? Should they abandon Rome right now because it's just too dangerous? Or are they God's seed to bring change to it? Even amidst all the persecution. It's a good word for a nation like this in times like this. One's got to ask and not get caught like we've heard already in this time between two opinions. One's got to know certain things. And in the midst of that, Paul's, Luke ministers to him. He gets permission to be in the prison. And he's ministering to Paul. And Paul's old, of course. And, and it's now life is coming towards an end. And he, he's captive. He's watching over him. And he gets a bit more freedom through all this developing Captive begins to see some, the man who's watching over him in captivity, beginning to see to him. And then he says to Paul, he says this, you're trying to convince me. Paul's sharing his faith with him. He said, you're trying to convince me. And Paul just looks at him and says, no, I'm not. I can't convince you of anything. He says, but it only takes a moment. It is Christ himself that looks upon you and shatters your defenses. And at that moment, you will understand that you are completely known by God and completely loved. All the striving goes out. You're exposed and loved. And in that moment, as he talks to the one who's imprisoned him and shares, moments happen. I mean, it only takes a moment. There's some people here today that need a moment. Just when God breaks through the defenses, lifts you out of your preconceived ideas, out of the traditions of man that may have locked you in the bondage rather than brought you forth into freedom. One old man who wrote books like, he wasn't so old then, but The Tale of Three Kings and The Divine Romance, once said this, and I say this to 
those particularly that are leading churches, take it to heart. He once said this, some people go out to build themselves a church and end up building themselves a prison. Quite profound, really. Because as we about what God's about, there's something bigger. It takes a moment sometimes, just a revelation. I had one of them just in, in October. I was just a couple of weeks before the 500-year anniversary of, of um, the Protestant Reformation. I was in Wittenberg, and I've been talking and talking here with our leaders and that about seven years I've been going into East Germany, and I always had a desire in my heart to be there around that 500-year anniversary. Why? I, I didn't really know, but I just wanted to be there. And I got there, um, it wasn't the actual day of the anniversary, but I was there ministering in Magdeburg just a few weeks before, just two or three weeks before. And as I was just got to Wittenberg and I was standing there looking at those doors in the, you know, where engraved into it now, at least as the 95 thesis, etc. And it's all locked into there. And I'm standing there. I went into the building where Paul preached, uh, Paul preached, where uh, Martin Luther preached. And I tried to climb up into his pulpit, but they stopped me. I tried to take a photo. They said, you can buy one over there. But, you know, it's a, it was a wonderful moment. But the whole place is so, it's a beautiful place to go. It's a beautiful German town. And most of it's in honor of, of Luther now. It's called Luther Sat now, as well as, Wittenberg. But as I stood there before those doors and I had a wild German evangelist standing with me who took me there. And as I did it, I wasn't so overcome with the Protestant Reformation, although I was. I was just overcome with the power of a moment of revelation. The just shall live by faith. He could have never known what was going to happen in the world because of that moment. He wasn't a, he was a strange guy in many ways, Martin Luther. He was rough, a bit of a drunk, loves late night beer, drinking out with his mates and things, arguments, fights, all kinds of stuff. But in the midst of a moment of revelation, the just shall live by faith. You realize up to that moment, there'd only been three churches on the earth. There's what we call the early church, you know, that was made up of churches in various places. But then after Rome, there was a Roman Catholic church, of course, after Constantine in 3014 to 17 there, 314 to 17. There was that which became the Roman church. And then there was a breakaway or the enlargement of that that was called the Orthodox church. So when it got to Luther, there was only been really three. Since then to now, there's been over 57,000 denominations. So something happened in that moment. Some for good, some for bad. Wars have been fought. People have been put to death. There's been all kinds of things happen in the, in the midst of it, but something incredible shifted on the earth. And that's what I really want to talk to you about more today. But as I sat there in that moment and looked at it, I thought, God, the power of a moment of revelation. The just shall live by faith. It's incredible, really. You see, if you look at from that moment to this moment in where we live and what we wrote down some 30-odd years ago in Church of the Nations and became a part of our foundations and that kind of thing, was the acceleration of the kingdom of God on earth and the restoration process. See, when Luther started what we, what we call the restoration process, and that's why I'm, you know, many of us know this better than I do and could teach on it. But when we look at that as the beginning, if you like, of the restoration process, something began to happen. You see, what had happened before, there was this glorious church that was born, a kingdom mind, people, the government of God was in the church, there was the ecclesia, there was the synagogue, there was a safe house as well as the government, all of that kind of thing. And as it was going through its time up to 314 AD in the Constantine era, when Constantine grabbed hold of something and began to take out the very heart of what was there. Not everything he did was bad. I'm not going through all his life. But just to say something began to shift. And what began to shift affected us immensely. 
See, what did he do? He took away a number of things. First, he took away first fruits. It's all documented out of giving. Why? Because he wanted to bring first fruits back to tithe and offerings and control it through the central fund. First fruits was releasing freedom of giving and that kind of thing. So he stopped it. He brought it back to three. Because biblically, he brought it back to the two. Because biblically, nearly everything that's going to last, these three shall remain. It's normally three that shall remain if it's going to last. So one of the restoration things that have happened was that 13 years ago for us and for others other times, a real understanding of first fruits. Why? Not just because of the money side of it, but because of the actual age in which we were living and where we were moving through to understand what the resurrection of the dead was even going to really mean. So as we've traveled that through and got to understand that, that's really helped. Because when you look at Scripture, it's hard sometimes to wrestle with these things. When you read a Scripture where it says, you will receive the first fruit of the Holy Spirit, I thought I had all of him. But the Scripture says you got the first fruit of him. Why? And that's only about a 40th when we understand it in first fruit teaching and understanding why. Because it only takes a first fruit to sanctify you, but it will take all of him to glorify you. That's why he cannot glorify you until we get our resurrected bodies or he smashes to smithereens. It's a good thought, isn't it? See, when Jesus walked in through the wall after his resurrection with his resurrected body, he walked in through the wall. He doesn't have to worry about that anymore because his resurrected body is not limited to that which we're limited to. I love what a famous South African teacher teaches on that, that we love, Derek Morphew, on the kingdom. He says one of the miracles of that is when you walk back out through the wall, the fish went with him. <laughs> that was a transforming power within him of what was going on, I'm sure. But that's a, a great, you know, a great picture. But there was this process that started that we call restoration and it says that Jesus is held back like a racehorse waiting for that day of the restoration of all things now I don't want to go through it all here like I didn't in the first session but I want to just emphasize this to you when you study it we've got it on our CD series it's out in a book that was written in Church of the Nations years ago all of that has been right through because when Ron began to pen those words with us in those early years and together we were exploring what church was going to be like in Church of the Nations and at his death 13 years ago we re-released re the book in Cotton and that kind of thing. It was because what we saw was the acceleration of the kingdom on earth. And as we studied it and went through the history of it we realized that the more restoration went on the faster it was happening. Now, if you understand that and get to where we are today, we live in the most incredible moment of history that you could ever imagine. But when you study through church history like that and get some kind of hold of it, at least even briefly, in our hearts, you realize something that's really vital in our heart, and it's this, that every time there's restoration, now and then in those restoration processes, there is a seismic shift. And when a seismic shift takes place, the world is never the same again. Now we've got to ask ourselves the question, because in between those seismic shifts, there are many waves of revival and things we've heard of to cry out for, because we need waves and that continually as the blessing of God rolls over. But now and then there's a moment in history when something bigger than a wave of the Spirit sweeps over us. Something happens that's a seismic shift that alters the earth. And the question we've got to ask is this, are we on the edge of one of those right now? Is it already happening? Is it already before us? In our Western culture, we've become the tail, not the head. Are we behind it now? And we haven't got eyes to see like Willie Crew was sharing with us last night a little bit. It's incredible what's happening. I follow the, the stuff with Dido and the guys a little bit in Madagascar. It's unbelievable what's happened there in the last few years. Over 3,000 works established in Madagascar. And their heart and seed come out of us as a family. Every time I get their, their update, I, I kind of weep, you know, because what's happening through persecution, through all kinds of stuff, with the Islamic stuff and all that kind of thing that's going on, over 3,000 works established in the last two or three years. One of the men that's building them in foundations a part of uh, a COT and church up at New Creation. But it's incredible when you just 
hear and see the, the movement. Are we in a seismic shift? Is it going to alter something or is it just another wave of the, of the blessing? When I say that, I don't say that lightly. We need the waves, incredible power, because they shift us. But so and then there's a seismic shift. And when you look at it, you know, the birth of the kingdom was a seismic shift on earth, wasn't it? When Jesus cried out from the cross that day, it is finished, the world went through a seismic shift. He wasn't just crying out, my sin was finished. He was crying out and declaring to the heavens and under, to the earth and under the earth, it is finished. Satan, your rule of earth is over, Adam is back. And exactly the same process. We heard over the time, where was the first place God took Jesus when he was born, you know, and then became a son when he was 30 and he heard that this is my beloved son. Where was the first place Jesus was taken? Was in the temptation. Why? Because that's where the first Adam lost it. And he was reclaiming step by step, line upon line, everything that was taken out until he could stand on the, on the cross that day, hang on the cross and cry out, it is finished. He sealed into eternity once and for all that this kingdom would be family built, not structure built. Why? How do you read that into there? Because as he had the weight of sin on his broken body, his diaphragm collapsing, Blood everywhere. He couldn't hardly keep his head up. He's about to give in, in that sense, to give up the, the ghost, in that sense. What does he do? He looks down and sees his mother and sees his, a spiritual son who he loved, John. And he says, Mom, John, Mom, John, this is your mum now. Mum, this is your son. Unbelievable that he couldn't die in that moment without taking care of a family. And we somehow think what he launched from that is a structure or an organization that one day is just led by CEOs and not fathers. Every bit of restoration costs every possible thing. And said, from that day on, Mary moved in with John. You want to know about spiritual sonship? Let me tell you this bit. Why do you think that Jesus moved Mary in with a spiritual son, not a natural brother? I don't know the answer to that, but I know this. You can think about it, you'll understand the impact he sees on spiritual sonship. That sometimes is far more real and outgrows even natural family relationships. That's the power of this stuff, of the kingdom we're in. It's an alternative kingdom. There was a seismic shift on earth that day. Whoever would understand that this lowly man from Galilee, people that was persecuted, wandering around, you know, broke all that kind of thing of his journey of life, that one day the Western world, at least in the world generally in many ways, but the world at large, would restart counting the days of their calendar. That atheists would still get up on days that are marked in their calendar because of that one man. Everything became BC or AD. He became the center of the universe. This lowly one life. What a seismic shift. Huh? That's why I love Easter this time because it was the only time that the the Satan and Jesus we celebrated on the same day. Wasn't that exciting? Man went before a judge in the USA and said, we as atheists deserve to have a day to recognize our religion as well. And the judge just smiled and said, you do. It's April 1. <laughs> the Bible says, he who, he who says there is no God is a fool. This year... Easter Sunday and April Fool's Day was the same morning. That was exciting, wasn't it? Not, that doesn't very often happen. I got up that morning, I was so excited, you know, I'm thinking. <laughs> Sometimes my mind moves a little different way to some others, you know, but that's me. Seismic shift, the shift of the earth. Then came the Constantine era. 
shifted the earth one more time because it took the heart of Christianity out and put the structure of it in. And, you know, it was so powerful, so done. You know, what happened up to then under persecution for all kinds of reasons, the church didn't meet anywhere but very organically for persecution and all kinds of things. But then they became legit. Now they could meet in buildings like the pagan religions. They could have a pulpit that's way up there so they could look down on the people and there'd be a separation of clergy and the people. They did the finances, did everything else. You know, I, I could go through it all. There's a whole list. But there was a seismic shift on the earth that happened that released what we call Christianity into a religion rather than a relationship. Took us down a path for a number of years, 1,200 years, until we got all the way down to the 1500s when another seismic shift happened. In that seismic shift, as it happened, it was unbelievable. It was this man, Martin Luther, who on his knees that day or wherever he was, he heard that revelation, the just shall live by faith. Do you realize Europe, most of the world, has never been the same again since that moment? It caused wars. It turned nations upside down. It changed national uh, boundaries. It was incredible what took place, all because of that moment of revelation. And then through, from that time, there were restoration process began to take place. And that's what we've taught here in conferences before. And that's why I say to the delegates who know it so well again, I say unto you, because it's a very anchor of what we believe in the kingdom message is the acceleration of what began to happen from that moment on. God began to raise up the ones. I'm not going through it all today, but there's Martin Luther. You know, in the 1500s, then a few years later, the Anabaptists. Why? Because God was, the Bible says that he's held back to the restoration of all things. So everything that was taken out through those years into the dark ages had to begin to be restored. And when water baptism got restored through the Anabaptists, it's hard to believe. I used to sit, minister quite a bit in Needle Park in Switzerland. Needle Park was the centre of the drug world back in those days. It was, well, it was Amsterdam, then into Switzerland and down to Kathmandu. And we used to go down to minister the drug addicts there in Needle Park right at the end of the Bonnerstrasse. The government would issue out 10,000 clean needles every night in that park so people didn't have dirty second fixes. Unbelievable when you think. A youth generation, gone. And we'd be down there trying to reach them. I saw things I couldn't hardly explain. I saw people stand there so high on drugs, they had their thumb like that and drill it till it got right through the skin, right through the flesh, right through the bone you could see inside the head under the power of narcotics and demons. Sometimes we'd be so tired we'd go and sit on the edge of the rocks we just sit up there on the rocks, hang our feet over the side of the rocks. Because right at the back of the Bonnerstrasse, which was the wealthiest shopping street in the world at that time, two rivers met. And where those two rivers meet, at the top part of Zurich there, right behind the station, I'd sit there and reflect, God, these rivers used to run red with the blood of martyrs, Anabaptists because they got put to death because they believe you could be water baptized. We fill up a bit of a tank in the service, say hallelujah, sing a song, amen, you're baptized, we all go home. It costs people their lives that that could be restored. <laughs> There's never been anything of restoration that hasn't brought forth from the blood of martyrs. Not really the happy message there. But it began to increase. We all know the story. It was George Fox in the 1650s, the Pietists in the 1600s, the Moravians with their foreign mission and their zeal for 24-hour prayer. Then came the Wesley. And in the Wesley move, after all those waves through those hundreds of years, there became another seismic shift. The world looks back to what happened in that Wesley era, followed by the boo there in England, as probably the biggest kingdom shift on earth that's ever taken place. See, we hear of 24-hour prayer, we get all excited, but we've got to know that was put into place through the Moravians all those years of place. They had a prayer meeting went 99 years or 101 years, depending which record you read, without a break, 24-7, 99 to 101 years. And in there they got the zeal for foreign missions, sold themselves out, went to 
plantations because they got a picture of a king in the kingdom. As those guys were leaving on the boats out of Europe to uh, join themselves to slaves in the slave plantation because they heard no one could share the gospel with them. With the money they got for selling themselves into slavery, they paid their fare on the boat to get there, knowing they'd never come back. As they left, with a hand cupped over the mouth and an arm round his mate, the others were yelling out, why are you doing it? Why are you li- giving your life away? Why? And it, one cried out, as the records say, cried out, which became the battle cry of the Moravian movement. So the lamb who was slain might receive the due reward of his sufferings. They didn't go for the slave. They went for the king who took them to the slave. See, if you don't understand that, you won't understand kingdom life. You won't understand why Jesus could walk into a pool one day, heal one person when there was crowds there to get healed, then go home. Not only go home, go to the feast. I say to sons I work with on a regular basis, you're never going to run this course well unless you know how to go to the feast when you're surrounded by need. If it had been us, we would put a sign up, Jesus is moving and healing today and pray for everybody else in the room. But Father only said to Jesus, one man. Then he left through the crowd and went home. Next time he saw the man was at the feast. Someone mentioned over this conference about when they got to the gate, beautiful, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Could you imagine if you were the guy? His first reaction was probably in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You mean that guy that's walked past me for years and never healed me? But there was a moment. A moment. We have those moments. <laughs> On it went. Where's it? You know, it's hard for me to believe as an ex Salvation Army person the power of that movement that happened after Wesley and the Salvation Army across Great Britain. It's unbelievable. Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said this, and I want to say this to you for all of us that carry a kingdom heart and want social reform. Booth's great cry before he died, he said, I only have one real fear, and that is that one day the Salvation Army may only be remembered as a social organisation. What he feared has come upon it. Why? Because they kept the good works but lost the power. Found a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. To when we were seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it was something that had gone past and wasn't for today. It doesn't take much. I understand in Church of the Nations we're only ever a week away from being an old wineskin. It didn't take much. I grew up in the restoration movement of Great Britain that had the hope and the possibility of changing a country. And it was wonderful. But the tragedy is all kinds of other things got in. And if you go to Great Britain today, probably the greatest moves of God upon the nation, these guys could confirm better than me, is coming back out of the Anglican church again. Why? You don't get all that many chances to carry the to pull the king's carriage. Once God disconnects it, it's hard to get it back sometimes. Or once we disconnect it. It's hard for me to believe in the Salvation Army saw such powerful moves of God. We talk about getting slain in the spirit and knocked out by the power. Read their book. I, I've got papers this long, 30, 40 pages. Why? It's called this, The Apostolic Adventures of the Salvation Army from George to Port Elizabeth. What they saw, what they did, it's unbelievable. They'd be in meetings in England and Booth would be preaching the conviction of sin would come so, so great in the meetings they had a mercy seat at the front where you knelt and they couldn't get there. They were so paralyzed with conviction. They saw the Holy Ghost reach down, rose from the back, pick up people by the collar, lift them up above the height of the people, transport them in the spirit and drop them at the mercy seat. 
And somehow think we see a few miracles and we think, oh, God's restoring it. No, it's well restored. We've just got to get in the fullness of what's been restored. And somehow not live in our Western mindset that when God does a little something with us, that he's reinvented Christianity. Oh, and that was like when you're young, you think as soon as something happens with us, boy, everything else is irrelevant. But God doesn't move on from, he builds upon. Line upon line, precept, until the day of restoration of all things is here. Those was brethren, the Finney moves. Booth, I mean, you imagine Finney, what it must have been like working in factory, just sitting there and he takes a tour of a factory and as he goes through it, people just fall off their seats in the factory getting saved. They had to shut the factory for two or three days. But they had something, they saw something in the kingdom. Booth, when he sent out apostolic teams, we would shudder to think of it today. When he sent out an apostolic team to plant France, he sent out three girls in their teenage years. One was his daughter. They walked into the darkest pubs in downtown Paris at the turn, not of this century, the one before. You can imagine what it was like. But they were filled with a vision and a passion and a heart. They went in there, every sexual innuendo thrown at them, the abuse, the misuse was more than we could even say in a meeting like this. Until one day his daughter, I think only 18 years old, stood up in that pub and looked out over these drunken, brawling, French, turn-of-the-century people and said, "Will you, if I give you 20 minutes, if I stand here and give you 20 minutes where you can say anything you want to say to me, abuse me in any way that you want in language, Will you then give me 20 minutes to say to you what I want to say? And they did, yeah, and they abused her. Then she stood up and for 20 minutes shared the love of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit fell on the bar and the Salvation Army was born in France. And we fight and argue whether women should be in the ministry or not. It's unbelievable. You know what I mean? Should they teach? Should a woman teach? Yeah. It's like sitting around thinking, our ah, first fruits for today. Please. They're saying something much bigger than money or a thing or something. They're saying something of a kingdom acceleration. All the way you go through all those, finishing them in, all the way you go through all those kinds of things, it got quicker and quicker and quicker. There were seismic shifts. And here we are right today, poised in history as things speed along so fast. I'm blessed at my age, being in the 70s now. Someone said to me one time, we were joking about this the other day with Caddy, but someone said to me, you don't really look 80. I said, that's good because I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm just too... <laughs> But I'm in my 70s. <clears throat> I can still dream the dreams. It's a vision bit for the younger guys. Still dream the dream a bit. But I was alive when the last seismic shift happened on earth. You can follow it. The birth of the church, what happened with Luther, all the way through that Wesleyan stage. That was an incredible shift. The latter rain introduced another one that was on the way, the latter rain movement, and now we're getting into our time zones. Because these things, once they happen every 100 years, 120, then they're happening every 60 or 80, things of restoration. Then every 30 or 40. And then it was rolling quicker. Why? Because why did we write it down all those years ago? Because this, we, we saw the kingdom was accelerating fast on the earth. Why is it? It's just to get hold of that in our hearts. It's hard to believe when you read the statistics, isn't it? Hard to believe when the, the guys in Kansas City came out with the statistics, you know, a couple of years ago and saw that in AD 100, one out of every 100, 360 people on the world were followers of Jesus. By the year 1000, one out of every 220 were followers of Christ. By 1500, one out of every 69 people who were alive at the time were believers in Christ. And these times were when their seismic shifts were beginning to happen. It's now estimated, or by 1990, the number of followers had risen to one out of every seven. And now on planet Earth today, linked with Jesus one way, they may not all be kingdom believers and all understand it like we do, but on the Earth today, right now, where we are, one out of every two to two and a half people on the planet are identified with Jesus. 
and we think we lose him. This kingdom knows nothing but increase, Jesus said, and the zeal of the Lord will perform it. Just got to get into agreement with it somehow. But 50 years ago came one of the greatest seismic shifts in recent times. We called it the charismatic movement or the Jesus people revolution. It's where I got launched in the ministry. Many of the leaders in the body of Christ up to 10 years ago were launched. 10, 20 years ago on the earth, anyone that was leading in the body of Christ in some way, you could say to them, what happened? And they took it back to the charismatic movement or the Jesus people when Jesus got hold of their life. Sadly, it was only one donkey. Had no fathers. Oh, we were riding it. Sometimes we forgot we should have been the donkey and someone else was on our back. A bit like the donkey taking Jesus in that day. <laughs> the ass taking him in, you know. Probably looked at the younger one and said, man, look at the big crowd that turned out to see us. <laughs> Their mum probably said to the young one, it's not you, son, <laughs> who's on your back? We could remember that sometimes in church, it'd be good. Do we carry? But it was an incredible moment in history. The world shifted. Do you realize prior to that time, what we did in here this morning, what the musicians did this morning, would be seen as total worldliness and evil. To have a guitar in a, more, in a service was totally worldly. Like I often said, you'd have an organ on one side if you was really free, a piano as well. If you move the, organist from one side, the organ from one side of the stage to the other, you'd have a church split. If you move the organ, this you would have a revolution. Our favorite hymn was, We Shall Not Be Moved. <laughs> and here we were poised. The world was poised in an exciting situation. <laughs> Acceleration of the kingdom. It's unbelievable. It's poised in this incredible situation. What was it like? University students were pouring out of colleges all over the world on the streets in protest. They believed they'd been dealt with unjustly. There was revolution on the streets. Love power was beginning to rise. There was lack of faith in governments. Those on the left felt the right were ripping them off. Those on the right felt the left were just liberals. So instead of finding any other way of meeting, there became the great divide. The kids went to flower power and copped out of any other kind of life. The world began to shift and change. We were involved in a war that we thought would have no end. We called it Vietnam. And the nations were in panic mode. Governments didn't know what to do. There was upheaval everywhere around. Almost sounds like we're talking about today. And Jesus sees the moment for a seismic shift. The shift is something that's seen us through till today. We call it liberally charismania. It broke loose on the earth and it changed Christianity forever. 